Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Warwick Fairfax. I'll tell you all about Warwick in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is a LinkedIn live show that focuses on what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment, the compassion we show for others. And when you do it as a leader, and you, so you will find out that Warwick certainly is, um, you do it to bring people together for common cause, and you use your energy to bring people together. So Warwick Fairfax, welcome to Grace Under Pressure. So. Thanks so much, John. Great to be here. I want to tell everyone around you, uh, the theme of our show is grace under pressure, and you certainly exemplify that, as you will tell us. So anyway, you are the, fourth, uh, you are the founder of Crucible Leadership, a philosophical and practical breakthrough in dealing with setbacks and business failures and coming out whole on the outside, something that you had experienced at a very young age, which gives you great perspective into what it takes to lead and survive under pressure. So when you were only 26, you were a fifth generation heir to an Australian media uh, company and the company was uh, lost in a takeover bid. So you learned a hard lesson at a young age. So that didn't set you back. Uh, you went on to a successful business career and things like that. Now you have a new book, which is called Crucible Leadership. Embrace your trials to lead a life of significance. And that certainly is what you have and what you'll tell us all about. Warwick, you are a native of Australia and you live in Annapolis, Maryland. Welcome to Grace Under Pressure. So, Well, thanks so much. Very much looking forward to it. Good. So what's, um, tell us the backstory. So you were a young, a fifth generation heir, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, and then you had a successful media company and age 26, you're the heir running it, and suddenly things happen. So give us the backstory, please. So. Yeah, well, thanks. So, you know, I grew up in this fifth generation. Uh, it was a large uh, media company. It had the Australian equivalent of the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal of our country. I had uh, TV stations, radio, magazines, 4,000 plus employees, 750 million in revenue. It was a massive company. But growing up, it was a little bit like growing up in the, uh, you know, British royal family, if you will. Uh, so it'd be kind of like saying to Prince William, yeah, do you really want to go in the family business? I mean, how, <laughs> I mean, you know, his dad and grandmother would say, how could you do that? And obviously, you know, it's tough when you don't go into it, like is Harry <laughs> fine? So to me, it felt like I had no choice. And so i I kind of made the mistake, as I euphemistically say, of being the good son. I sort of, you know, there's the prodigal son. Well, I was the one that stayed home in that uh -huh. sense. So I worked hard, got good grades, uh, didn't do dumb stuff as a lot of kids of wealthy families do. Um, sure. You know, did my undergrad at Oxford, like my dad and some other relatives, worked on Wall Street, got my MBA at Harvard Business School. It was all about fulfilling my role, my duty kind of like the duty on a country thing, as they say in the military here. So, yeah, when my um, dad died in early 87, he was in his 80s. I was from his third marriage. There was instability. The company was 50% uh, owned by the you know public. The share price went up. I felt like the company wasn't being managed well, wasn't being run along the lines of the founder. Whether that was true or not is another perspective, but I launched this $2 billion plus takeover. Other family members sold out because they didn't want to be in a company controlled by a 26-year-old. I mean, who would? Uh, and stock market crash in 80, October 87 hurt our asset sales. So by the end of the year, we had an unsustainable level of debt. Three years later, Australia got in a big recession and the company went under. So that's the brief version of what happened, uh, a little bit of the why. But uh, yeah, it was just a cataclysmic, epic failure on so many so many levels. Well, it's, what's interesting is that you did everything right <laughs> and maybe doing what was right. Maybe you should have been more of a rebel or perhaps do you think in retrospect you should not have taken over at such a young age? Do you, have you thought of that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of mistakes. I mean, I had a Harvard MBA and I expected the other three major or the other two major shareholdings to stay in the company controlled by a 26-year-old. 
you shouldn't need a Harvard MBA, which I had. We're talking months after graduating. It wasn't like it was years ago. <laughs> yeah, months. you knew everything, so why not? Yeah. Well, you know, but sometimes amidst the emotions, we make poor decisions. So, for instance, um, you know, my dad, who I dearly loved, he was there was some turmoil in '61 when he was briefly thrown out as chairman, and then 1976, some other family members successfully because they had enough shares, removed him as chairman. So that, was that some of the psychological backstory? Who knows? But, um, you know, I was young, naive, idealistic. And, um, uh, you know, I brought in new management that increased operating profits 80% the first year. So, yeah, maybe it could have been better managed. But, you know, I just made some cataclysmically poor assumptions. Still to this day, I look back and think, how could I have been so dumb? How could I have made those decisions? But there's always a reason, emotions naivety, idealism, you know, off, what do they say? The path to hell is paved with good intentions. I mean, I never meant to hurt anybody, but I caused instability. You know, uh, I mean, right. people didn't so much lose their jobs, but just no Fairfax family. It's a lot of turmoil. Right. Well, that's it. You know, that's the, the sad part of it is you weren't a wastrel. You did things for the right, right. intentions and they didn't work well. So right. which brings right. us to the title of crucible leadership. And I love that because and you likely know uh, Warren Bennis once wrote an essay and perhaps it was in one of his many books where he talked about no senior leader or no successful leader he had ever met had not at one time been in the crucible. So that yeah. was you. <laughs> so, and you for, for many, it happened in a young, a young, an older age, but for you, it was right. age 26. So Right, so. right. No, exactly. Right. So, yeah, I mean, when you go through a crucible, and, you know, we have our own podcast, Beyond the Crucible, and with 75-plus guests, I mean, whatever your crucible is, it could be business failure, physical tragedy, abuse, trauma, your fault, not your fault. It's, it's, a, it's sort of a pivotal mm -hmm. moment and you're faced with a choice. You can be angry, bitter, and do the reverse of living a life of grace. You could be angry at yourself and others and just hide under the covers. And for the, eventually life will end for all of us. You know, there is an expiration date. Or you can say it wasn't fair. It was my fault, not my fault. But how do I move on? How do I forgive myself and others and lead a worthwhile life so that to me for me i had that choice but even so you know coming back from a devastating crucible most of the 90s were pretty tough years because i was so right. i was just not depressed clinically but i was just felt like look what i did how could i have been so dumb what do i do now i right. never thought about what life would be like as it was a pre-program so it's it's not easy but it does start with a choice so what was a moment of, as you went through dark times or experienced a tough time, so what was your first moment of light, if you will? So, Yeah, I think for me, you know, I'm a person of faith, so in my own, well, what made it tougher before I sort of answering the question is I felt like the founder was a person of faith, so I thought God must have some plan to have it run along the lines of the founder where people are valued and respected and all that. So feeling like I'd let God down in some ways was sort of the ultimate uh, devastating uh, trauma, if you will, for a, a person of faith. But I came to realize, you know, um, God is sovereign, and if he wanted it to succeed, it would have, despite my mistakes. So part of it was just that unconditional love of, of God, but just my wife, I've been blessed to be married to her. You know, she's American for 32 years. I met her in Australia the unconditional love of my wife and my, you know, young family in the nineties. So there's, there's a massive healing power with unconditional love, whether it's mm -hmm. from the universe, God, or your family or all of the above, uh, over, it doesn't heal you overnight, you know, but drip by drip, you know, it does begin to heal your soul, that unconditional love. Right. Now, we often talk about in, in business, of course, every business needs a vision, but mm -hmm. we as people need vision. So and I know you have something. Uh, what what was it that led you to develop your personal vision and where has it taken you, Warwick? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great question. So really, you know, before I could find a vision, I had to kind of rediscover my self-respect, which was as you would expect, decimating, $2 million loss, letting down family, ancestors, employees. Yeah, it was pretty pretty crippling, but 
uh, I mentioned the unconditional love of God and my family, but I, I got some, uh, you know, began to find work in an aviation services company doing financial and business analysis, analytical, got good performance reviews. That was helpful. Got into executive coaching um, through a mid-performance re uh, review um, sort of by external executive coach. Set a good profile for coaching. Got on two nonprofit boards, my kids' school board, church board. So I began to see that I love asking questions. I'm good on boards. I'm an advisor, sort of reflective advisor. I began to discover who I was and how I was designed. Mm -hmm. And really where it pivoted into crucible leadership is in 2008, um, the pastor of my church wanted me to give a short story. You know, He was talking about the life of David, uh, King David, a righteous man, falsely persecuted. Well, I'm not King David, but you want a story for 10 minutes? I can do that. And somehow what I said, people were able to relate to, I shared about my failure and vulnerability authentically and some lessons learned. But I thought to myself, how could my story help anybody? Because there weren't any like former media moguls in the congregation, as far as I know. I mean, you could get up and talk about cancer or what have you, and people and sadly could say, I can relate to that, or I have a family member. But nobody... Yeah you know, knows somebody or is somebody that's gone through what I've gone through. It doesn't mean it's better or worse. It's just so different. Right. But I thought if I can share my story in a lessons learned way that will help people. So I began writing in 2008. It took a long time to write and then, you know, build a platform to get it published. And it, you know, came out in, um, you know, October 2021. But it was all about if I, if my story can help people, but Imagine writing about the worst mistake or the dumbest things you've ever done. I couldn't do more than a couple hours a day. And I said, I've got to take a break. This is too painful. <laughs> it was well, really pain painful to write. But it's like, if my pain can help people, you, you've heard this a million times, a pain for a purpose. If it can help people, then I'm going to keep pressing on so that, you know, I can share my story and hopefully people right. can learn well, from it. You know, it's interesting because so, so much of business literature, what masquerades as, quote, literature and quote, it right. focuses on success. And rightly so. I mean, you know, we're all the heirs of Napoleon Hill, if you will, right. you know, or right. beyond that, right. you know, uh, other things, uh, other heroic stories, Horatio Alder kind of stories. Yeah. And those yeah. are good. Those are valid. Those are inspirational. Yeah. And that's fine. Um, but so often, I don't think we explore the topic of failure enough. So I have you in the crosshair right now uh, <laughs> so um i think failure is it's a cliche is a great teacher if we pay attention so um Absolutely. so when it's in your coaching practice um when someone tells you or you're working with someone experiences failure how do you open a door for uh, help them open a door for self-awareness so you know i think a couple things around failure certainly recovering from failure it's really a question of um, it's really a question of uh, identity. Um, so, you know, if you if you're a successful business person and you have a reversal, go bankrupt or get fired, if your whole sense of self is I'm the CEO, I'm a senior executive of X company, and my whole sense of self worth is bound up for that, you are setting yourself up for colossal, not so much business failure, but that too but personal uh, soul failure, if you will. And so really, you know, if you fail at business, for instance, you've, you've got to realize, you know, who you are as a person is separate than the market, than the economy, or even some poor business decisions. I believe from my faith perspective, we're all loved by God because of who we are as human beings. And so really, you know, even those who are successful, it's like, you know, that the time to prepare for disaster is when things are good. You know, and so well, you, uh, you, absolutely. You said something very important and it resonates with me. And and I think it's a lot of us have felt this. Um, and I think it contributes right to this day with a, a trend we call the great resignation, which um, it, people are questioning where they are. But so many people and so many professionals equate their professional ism and what they do for a living with their identity. So when you see that and those you speak to or coach, yeah. what are what what advice do you have for them? 
Michelle. Really, you know, the first step in, um, I mean, a couple of things coming back from a crucible. One is obviously you've got to understand your design, how you were made. But with identity, you know, I'm a you know, person of faith, in my case, Christian faith. But I think everybody has beliefs. It may be in a religion, a philosophy, spirituality. You cannot be human without having beliefs and values. And so what you have to dig down and say, what is it I believe? It's not about what other people believe, but what you know, you've got to be true to yourself, your own faith, your own values, your own beliefs. So that's really the first place to dig is, you know, based on my spiritual paradigm, what does that say about me? And pretty much every major religion, every philosophy that I know of believes that human beings have inherent worth, that our worth is not based on what we do. I don't know any philosophy or religion worth exploring that I've heard of. Um, that you know believes that we don't have value so that's really the first thing in overcoming failure is dig down deep into your own values and you know often what i find when i've coached folks and i'll ask them so help me understand what you're doing uh, you know do you believe how you're leading is in line with your values and beliefs and if they say no as an executive coach i'll say with a straight face so you know, I'm assuming you want alignment because if you don't have alignment, that tends to produce all sorts of psychological challenges. And that's absolutely great. If you want to change your values and beliefs or how you lead. As a coach, I'm non-judgmental. So if somebody says, yep, I need to change my beliefs and right now I'm into, you know, greed, uh, stealing and crushing other people and let me change my values <laughs> to, to be congruent with how I lead. Great. Oh. But 99% of humans will say, if I'm not leading in light of my beliefs based on my own evaluation, I need to change that. So it's not, people don't deliberately live outside their values. I don't think they don't think about it. They're too busy, but they don't want to ask those questions. But if you ask the right questions, people will say, gosh, you know, and if you live outside of your beliefs and values, you typically will be not happy. How many successful people do we know that are miserable? Well, because, you know, you know, money doesn't in of itself doesn't make you happy. You know, being a CEO doesn't in of itself doesn't make you happy. Being aligned to your fundamental beliefs, that is a certainly a better path to happiness than just, you know, uh, working your way up the corporate treadmill. So it's right. really, people just don't think of these questions. Right. Well, also uh, aligned to the vision is, and, and I think it's someone, I'm just going to go out on a limb here. It's um, vision is personal vision is what we want to do, but it's also it has to be aligned to purpose because that gives us the impetus to do something. Would you agree with that, um, Warwick? Absolutely. So, you know, what we call purpose is a life of significance, which we define as a life actually on purpose dedicated to serving others. Because, I think it's sort of my belief that if you could say, well, my purpose is to be, you know, incredibly rich and uh, whatever it takes to win. I mean, I don't want to go to jail, but short of <laughs> doing things that are, that are illegal, I'll do whatever yeah. it takes to win. Yeah. I think humans are wired that that won't make you happy. And even if you say, well, I don't agree with that, that's great. But you can't ignore how you're wired and designed. You cannot ignore basic psychology. I don't know any psychologist that will say narcissism is a way to happiness. You know, yeah. it's just not. If you want to be happy, you don't, you, if you're not altruistic at all, but let's say you want to be happy and fulfilled, that only happens from my perspective, a life is living. It's basically serving others. How can I make the world a better place? How can I serve humanity in some fashion? So purpose needs to be other focused for it to be a true purpose and frankly, for it to be fulfilling and bring satisfaction and joy. So there are certain paradigms that pretty much every major religion, every philosophy agrees with. And basically, basic human psychology would say, you want to be happy and fulfilled. I'm sorry, here's the bad news. You've got to focus on others. That's just, <laughs> that's just the straight truth. As, you know, a doctor comes into the room and says, you want to be healthy? Here's what you got to do, right? All right. No question. So um, tied up into this is, you know, determining one's purpose or, uh, and then vision or, or whichever um, is tied up with your authenticity. So the who, the real you. So what's your take on authenticity in the Warwick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know, it's related to identity is, you know, you've got to be willing to be you. 
you know, um, not the fake you, not the, you know, what people in Hollywood or New York or whatever, you know, the persona. Because you, you're not, if you live an inauthentic life, that also produces dissonance, conflict, and certainly not happiness. So you've got to say, look, I am valued because of who I am. My, from my perspective, it's because we're designed by God. But you might think designed by the universe, whatever it is. But just accept the fact that, you know, you are worthwhile in of yourself. If, if you can believe that who you are is, is good, you know, how you were made is good, so to speak, then, you know, by living in, in light of that, it's easy to live authentically. You know what? Young people today, employees, everybody, they want to, they want to work for authentic people. Fake, you know, people, it's harder than ever before to get, you know, a good team, good workers, because they have choices. And they will run a million miles in a nanosecond if you're this inauthentic plastic boss. So it makes sense for your soul. And frankly, if you want to keep your business afloat, you have to be authentic today. You know, you can't have a sustainable business without being authentic. Right. And uh, I, I, there's and, and I'm not going uh, not to throw you a trick question, but there's another side of authenticity right. and it leads to difference. And it's what if I'm a jerk? <laughs> what if the real me is a jerk? So then what do I do? <laughs> it's so. a great question. I think really, you know, look at your values and, and beliefs. Now, you might say my beliefs is, you know, stealing, hurting other people. Well, then you've got some deep psychological problems and you're going to need, need to see a psychiatrist or a psychologist. But for most people, it's not the case. And so, like for the boss that's overbearing, that doesn't listen, if you ask them and they gave them truth serum, do you, are you really living? Is that really who you are? Is that really who you want to be? Is this in line with your values? Says, well, no, but this is what you got to do to take, get ahead. And, you know, that's what my dad or mom did to me. And I'm angry and I'm bitter. And so basically I take out my frustrations out on other people hypnotize them, give them truth serum, whatever it takes. You know, so usually if you're this overbearing jerk, that's typically not who you want to be if you're really truthful. So I think the real the real you, I think for most people that don't have some deep clinical issues, is not that. So it's really it's like you may think that's the real you, but, but is it? Is, and is that who you want to be? And typically, you know, it's not who they want to be. And it isn't the real them. So it's like, you know, fight for the real you. Because I don't, I don't think we're all evil, I mean, in that sense, without getting a theological discussion, which would be different. But basically, I think we want to do good. But if, you know, if we listen to our better angels and get back in, in line with what we really believe, who we really want to be, who we really think we should be. I don't disagree with you unless there are some, unless psychosis is involved, exactly. which is way beyond my pay grade. Yeah, um, my, mine too. <laughs> but, part, but part of this is also, it gets to the idea, I believe very much leadership as an act. And I don't mean that in, in the sense of dissembling yeah. or lying, but also in the sense of getting out of oneself. And this comes from right. a sense of introversion versus extrovert. You know, many, many leaders that I've worked with are known are introverts, mm -hmm. but they have learned to adopt an extroverted behavior. Why? Because that's what the business demands. That's what sure. management demands. Um, have you encountered that kind of thing, Warwick? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, for me, I'm you know on the introverted end of the spectrum, but yet I'm deeply curious about people and I'm social. So you can still be true to who you are, but you know, I think often, like with coaches, I'd say more coaches than not are introverts. Why? Well, be, to be a good coach, you've got to listen to be able to ask questions. Sometimes, not all the case, sometimes extroverts can, you know, just want to keep talking and they don't want to listen. That's not, <laughs> that's not true of all extroverts, you know, certainly. But, you know, being, you can, many successful business leaders are introverts, you know, not all. But, you know, just be who you are. You can still be introverted and be successful because it's, you know, introverts can have this deep curiosity. If you ask people questions, do you tell me more about that? Oh, you know, that's interesting, that story about your wife, your husband, and your kids. And boy, that's a, you talked about that challenge in high school. Our team, they want to be known. If, if you as a boss show interest in them, you will build a powerful team. And you're not doing that just for an act. You do it because you care. Right. So there's different ways of leading, but introverts can be very successful leaders. They can oh, lead out of question. their compassion and out of their curiosity, you know? 
So uh, and, it can work. And, and I think that related to that of idea, it's not just authenticity. It's not merely, I just use that dichotomy of sure, extroversion sure. versus into introversion as a, a way of exploring it, but it's also determining one's legacy. And I had an interview um, recently with a folk who talked about, uh, it was Sukinder um, Singh Cassidy, who spoke about a time to go is when you know that you don't have any more impact. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just saying, I've done what I can do in this current position and this, and now it's time to find a new challenge. I think the problem is, is some people hang on too long. Have you encountered that, Warwick? So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, why you hang on too long? Because your whole identity is wrapped up and I'm CEO. And if I'm not CEO, the invitations will dry up, which, which they will. I mean, I've heard, like even my dad left as chairman of the company. He got letters saying, Ak, you don't need to come to this function at X consul or X embassy because you're no longer in that position. It's not personal, but, you know, yeah. that stuff happens. But, you know, it, it does come back to identity. And, you know, you mentioned legacy. Um, I think if you want to try and understand why you should lead differently, you know, and I'm sure your guests mentioned this, it's been mentioned a lot. You know, very few people want to see their legacy as a billionaire or CEO. It'll be, you know. Uh, father, mother, you know, husband, wife, partner, parent, what have you. And they want to feel like their legacy is being good with their family, but you're making a positive difference in the world. So it's that it's, you know, live your legacy today, so to speak. And so, you know, that if that doesn't motivate you, nothing will. It's like, do you want to be seen as this overbearing boss that chews people out? Is that what you want your legacy to be? Because everybody that knows you thinks that hypothetically, you know, in a yeah. given situation. So that that should motivate you to live uh, a good life. Absolutely. And, and it's interesting, a little side note, and I'm sure you think this, when we think of legacy, we naturally think of the, the end of our career. But actually, I, I believe, and I think you do too as an executive coach, that legacy is something we uh, accrue every day. And there are minuses exactly. and pluses. And at the end, we hope, the pluses outweigh the minuses. So. Absolutely. You know, every day it's an opportunity to live your legacy and live what you believe and live who you want to be or the reverse. And none of us are perfect. So we'll have days in which we get angry, we act in a way that's not in accordance with who we want to be. And that's where you have to get used to apologizing. You know, forgive others. And you are, you, know, are you talking to me, uh, Warwick? <laughs> myself, everybody included. It's like yeah. apologizing. Just because you apologize doesn't mean you're a horrendous person. It just means you're human. So, yeah, I think the game of life is won and lost in everyday decisions and how you treat people, the decisions you make. You, yeah, your legacy is built one one brick at a time, one minute, one second at a time. And so, yeah, you know, it's not like. It's like, oh, I need to lose weight. I'll do that next year. You know, I'll, I'll be healthier. I'll eat better. Well, no, you know, you know, I'll, I'll be a better person next year. No. Today is the day when you've got to, again, it's not about what I or you believe. You've got to live in line with what you believe, you know, what you think matters. You know, you want, don't you want your parents and family members to be proud of you? Well, you know, you, you, live, you live a life in light of your values assuming it's aligned with compassion and grace and humility, you'll find you're actually, you know, you become loved by family and friends. It's, there's no, it's not a secret. You know? Great. Well, we are racing toward the end of our show, uh, Warwick. And I want to ask you a question I ask every guest, and that's a story of grace. Do you have one you'd like to share with us? So, you know, I do. I mean, um, after the company went under and we moved to the U.S. in the early 90s, um, you know, uh, my um, I'd been married to my wife for 32 years. I'm, you know, that unconditional love, I mean, that's not necessarily common. You know, I had a family member say to me, boy, you know, you, you did very well. It's like you, basically the implication was the company went under and your wife is still with you kind of thing. Because <laughs> when you're in the world of the rich and powerful, it's common that the wife or husband, as the case may be, say, nothing personal, but I need to move on to somebody that can, you know, help me, uh, give me the jewels and the lifestyle that I want. And, you know, and so we weren't poverty stricken by any stretchy imagination. We weren't billionaires, but we were fine. 
but just that unconditional love of my wife. I mean, not once did she say, Warwick, you were an idiot, which I was <laughs> in a lot of ways. Not once did she say, how could you have done this? Yeah. There was just this. So when you have unconditional love from your wife, husband, family, that, you know, and frankly, with my dad having been married three times and my, my mother twice, having a wife of over 32 years, every day I just say, thank you, Lord. I'm so grateful to have a loving partner in life that to me, at least absent faith, that is the ultimate human grace on earth to have a partner that loves you unconditionally just, be, just because that's the ultimate grace for me in life. What a great story. And that's, uh, you will be a, a hero to husbands everywhere. And, <laughs> and, and <laughs> but it's all, it's two ways. It's, uh, yeah. and I'm sure that your wife feels the same way about you because you are manifesting, uh, traits that appeal to her and her open heartedness. So, uh, Warwick, you have been a wonderful guest. How can people find you? So absolutely. They can go to my website, crucibleleadership.com. Uh, we post on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, have regular blogs every month and uh, other postings. Uh, of course, uh, we have a, a podcast, Beyond the Crucible, that talks about stories of bounce back from tragedy. And of course, my book, uh, Crucible Leadership, Embrace Your Trial Through the Life Significance. That's available in uh, you know, printed format, uh, ebook, and even audio book, where if you want to, you can listen to me for hours reading my book. <laughs> It's a weird thing to have to do, I got to say, but uh, yeah, if you're going to write a book and it's going to be an audio book, to me, you got to narrate it yourself. So. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Work, it's, we will put those in the notes. Uh, it is a pleasure to meet with you. Thank you for sharing you, your time and most importantly, your story and your lessons with us today. And with that, we'll go out and some. Thanks, John.